Good morning, and thank you for being here with us on the Alabama Way. Listen, today you kind of see the chairs rearranged here <laughs> because Trisha is with us today with the Alabama School Connection. And uh, you know, Trish, you have been busy. Very busy. There's a lot going on in education. <laughs> I, and I know, and I, we parents and some teachers mm -hmm. and different things, you might want to keep your ear to the TV here and kind of uh, listen at Trish and find out kind of what what's something what are some of the things that are going in going on I know the legislation's got a lot of things kind of in the works right or by mouth things are kind of right. working and trickling down and we right. kind of need to know these things that are coming up this year in school uh, of course we got the magnets that are mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are that are going and uh, the accountability Accountability Act That's right. and all of that. So, hey, I got you here today and I want to talk about all of this stuff. So, okay. you parents, uh, come sit down and let's talk. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I guess we have a, a few hours. Yes, right? we've got a few we hours a few here. Hours. Um, <laughs> where to start? You know, the legislature is going to be back in session. Uh, the state legislature, uh, our 140 elected officials, mm -hmm. 35 in the Senate, 105 in the House of Representatives, and they've already given us uh, a, a good indication that there will be some education reform legislation that will be introduced. Okay. Um, this uh, legislature, the Republican majority, has been very, very active in education reform ever since they took office. Mm -hmm. um, they did implement the Alabama Accountability Act. They did pass um, legislation allowing public charter schools in Alabama. Uh, and this year, what we expect is they're going to be reforming teacher tenure laws. Mm -hmm and um, creating a, a longitudinal data system, okay, or an LDS, that's what it's easier to say, LDS, uh, which is gonna track data on our children from pre-K all the way through the workforce. Um, you know, they're, they're looking at how to better evaluate teachers. Uh, a lot of folks kind of feel like maybe they're crossing into territory that might be better left to the State Board of Education or to the local boards of education, but they are the state legislature and they have the power to pass laws. Um, they're also talking about teachers getting a raise. There's something, you know, that I think teachers will be happy to hear. No word yet on how much that will be or if there will be any strings attached, though um, they're there's been some controversy in the last few weeks about tying teacher pay to student performance. And with that discussion happening, members of the legislature have said, we really don't want to tie teacher pay to student that, performance. That Marsh bill kind right, of thing. Right, right. Senator we'll Marsh. We'll kind of talk about yeah, that too. Yeah. But you know what, first Trish, uh, before we go too far, let's talk about that accountability bill. Okay. Oh, exactly. What, explain to us what that is now. The Alabama Accountability yeah. Act. Okay. It was passed, um, implemented, I want to, it was passed in 2012, implemented in 2013. Some people call it the AAA, mm -hmm. um, not to be as confused with the Alabama Automobile Association, right? right? right. <laughs> but so the Alabama Accountability Act, um, it did a couple of things. It, one thing that it did that doesn't get much uh, uh, press is it created uh, the ability for school systems to apply for waivers they call them flexibility waivers, to be innovative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and why that's important, they already have the ability to do that uh, with policies, mm -hmm. but the, the legislature gave them permission to do it with money. Mm -hmm. So the State Board of Education, State Superintendent, still has to approve whatever it is. Like, what'll happen, let's say Birmingham City Schools came and they wanted to do something really innovative and they wanted to move some money from one area of the budget to another, they have to write out, write out their plan in great detail and they have to give it to the State Superintendent, State Board of Education, who then reviews it, they ask a lot of questions, and then they'll either approve it or maybe delay it with some more questions or, or um, maybe they'll deny it. I do know a couple that have been denied. Um, but we don't have a lot of school districts that have taken 
advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Weiss, during the month of January, uh, our state superintendent and his staff have been on a tour uh, called the Alabama Innovation Tour, mm -hmm. and they've been to touring a lot of these places where this innovation is happening. And for example, um, they might be using, uh, they might have gotten flexibility to um, implement an arts curriculum that takes the place of social studies credits or something like that. You know, these long-standing things that we have come to believe are a part of schools that Dr. Bice has said, you know, be innovative. You know, maybe you've got kids that want to do, that really need arts and that that's going to add meaningfully to their life. Well, you know, find something else to substitute out. Maybe you don't want to do PE anymore. Right, Maybe So right. it's kind of a, an opportunity for districts to mess with the rules that are already there and to have the budgetary flexibility to use the money for that. Okay, that's the first part of the Alabama Accountability Act. The second part created um, uh, uh, tax credit scholarships, I'll explain that in a second, uh, for children who are uh, eligible for free or reduced lunch mm -hmm. to take that scholarship money that is uh, it's gathered up by private nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. and use that money to attend a private school. Okay, so at last count, there were about 3,500 kids in Alabama using those tax credit scholarships, and. Not a whole lot of them were zoned to failing schools, all mm -hmm. right, and and to to weave that into it. The idea was what the what the state legislature said originally was there are kids who are in these chronically underperforming schools and they need a way out. They need some school choice, so let's give them a way out. And so first you have to declare who the failing schools are, right? Mm -hmm. Which was you know I'm not a fan of that term. I don't think that a school is failing. I think that kids struggle and teachers struggle and communities struggle. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the term failing school. And it's based on test scores, mm -hmm. okay? Which test scores are one snapshot uh, right. of one day. Sure, patterns exist. We do have chronically underperforming schools where kids are struggling mm -hmm. year after year after year. So the idea was to give kids the scholarship money to get out of those failing schools. This is what the legislature told us. And in reality, not a whole lot of the kids that are in failing schools are using those scholarships to move to a different educational environment. So the jury's still out on that one. Uh, we're getting, we have more, uh, last year the legislator, legislature sort of updated the law and gave us uh, more data about those schools. They're now requiring more reporting so we know which schools are getting the scholarships. We know which kids were zoned for failing schools. We know which kids were in public schools last year versus private schools already. Mm -hmm. So we've got more information, but the analysis is still uh, out there. So it continues to this day. Um, a new list of failing schools will be uh, released anytime, and uh, you know, um, then kids will know if they're eligible to apply for those scholarships to get out of those failing schools. Okay. Uh, you know, and a, a lot of times, you know, I hate to say, you know, a lot of times when you say the failing schools, they're in, they're in the more poor areas right, and, right. And, and different things. In and every sometimes, case. And then you hear a lot of parents say, you know, I've had, I've had to deal with the hand that we've been dealt. Right. And, and that's sad to say, mm -hmm. because every child deserves an education. Every right. child deserves a good education. Right. And I'm going to say, now this is me, every child deserves a free education right. to be able to come and, and learn, you know. Right. And uh, it is so sad to me that sometimes we as policymakers and things, we can't decide on things for our kids. Right. Well, what you're getting to is a, a phrase that I use quite frequently um, is that in Alabama, we have historically made very purposeful decisions about which children and whose children we direct financial resources towards, okay, to educate them. It isn't by accident. It's a choice. Uh, there are things that can be done to improve chronically underperforming schools. 
You have to want to do it. Now, before you go into that, okay. I want you to go into that. Okay. We're going to go for a break and okay. come back. And you hold that thought there okay. because I, I really want you to get this point out here. Okay. So we'll be right back. Stay with us here on The Alabama Way. Okay, thank you for being here with us. Now, Trish, you know, we want to keep going with our conversation. We were talking about um, schools that are not, you know, in certain areas where, mm -hmm. you know, parents are saying they're kind of dealt with the hand th that they're dealt there. Right, right. But let's finish talking about that there because okay. I wanted you to make that point. Okay. Uh, and this is something I feel real strongly about because I do, I devote every moment of the day to reading latest educational research and what other states are doing. Chronically underperforming schools don't have to remain chronically underperforming schools. They also don't have to be closed, and they don't have to be emptied out, and they don't have to be neglected. Um, there are strategies that can be implemented to really go in and reconstitute a school, um, but it takes money. Right? It typically takes time, attention, laser focus is one of those ed reform terms that you hear, and money, and the desire. Mm -hmm. You really have to kind of start there, okay? You have to say, this school and the children within that school and that community are worth our attention. Once, if you can rally that kind of support, mm -hmm. whether it's with your superintendent or your board of education or with your local legislators or with your you know, local city council or whatever, you can make a change. You can't, we don't have to just keep doing things the way we've always done them. And in fact, um, there was a study done and it hasn't gotten a lot of press. I've written about it a couple of times, but I need to get back to it. The State Department of Education paid a consulting firm from out of state a few hundred thousand dollars to study Alabama's school finance system and how we fund schools. And they came back, the results were presented, I believe it was in September, to the state board at a work session. And this is a group that has done this in all 50 states. I mean, this is some, you know, this is a group with real credibility uh, studying school funding systems. And they came back and they said, not only is um, Alabama's, the way we fund schools, not enough, or the term they use is inadequate, it's also inequitable that we have allowed those who have to continue having and those who have not to continue to have not. Mm -hmm. So what you create in effect is this pyramid of kids, the ones at the top of the pyramid are getting all the goodies and getting all the great education and then the ones, the majority of kids in Alabama are getting a bare minimum education which is not enough, we know it's not enough to make them competitive in the marketplace. Either graduate from high school, go straight to work, or go to college, right? Uh, community college, four-year college, technical college, something, you know, to make them productive citizens. So we know this. Mm -hmm. We got the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and nothing's been said. Nothing's been done. And what they recommended, and this is really happening across the country, we're slow to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, is to fund schools based on students and the needs of those students. Right now, we use what's called a census-based approach, which is just based on a count uh -huh. uh, of kids. We're not looking at their needs. We have some extra formulas in there, like uh, uh, they assume 5% of your kids may have special needs, and then you get an extra this amount of money as a group to spread. No. What this group suggested was to look at, they call it weighted student funding, mm -hmm. okay? And so you weight the funding based on the needs of the kids. Sounds logical, doesn't it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that if kids who come from homes uh, who are struggling with poverty, if we know that they need more resources because they might be a little behind, maybe they are a lot behind, mm -hmm. uh, it, then maybe whatever that factor is, if you're going to, you know, if the state is going to provide $1,000 for that student, maybe it needs to be 1.2 times that, $1,200 mm -hmm. per mm -hmm. student. And, and then same thing with kids with special needs. One of the innovative ways that this group looked at funding um, kids with special needs is they broke out the level of ability, right? They said, you know, some kids have special needs, but that can be dealt with in the regular classroom, maybe with an aide or, or maybe a co-teacher. So we'll provide 
had some extra money for that. But then you've got kids, there were four levels of ability, and then you've got kids who are medically fragile, who may require a nurse being by their side all day long. Those kids can, you know, the cost can add up. They are entitled to a free and appropriate public education. Right. We don't send kids to institutions anymore, mm -hmm. thank heavens, right? So this, this whole big way of funding schools has been placed on the table and there's been no attention paid at all to it. And I think partly because we've been in such a financial crunch, uh, I don't think the state board or maybe the state superintendent wants to push that button yet mm -hmm. to say, but because what, what what they eventually they do some modeling you know like well what does it amount to and it was about 20 percent more per student we would need to be funding mm -hmm. so you say where's the money going to come from right where's the money coming from and it's a it's a terrible place to always be saying where's the money coming from um, but we know that money placed appropriately spent appropriately used on the right resources can make a huge difference for kids so we just have to get on it. You know, my thing is, too, here, we do these studies, <laughs> and what do we do with them? Right. You know, we do the study, we find out there's a need, right. and, and what happens? Right. Well, hopefully, um, you know, I was really stunned that the mainstream media just did nothing. There were just there was just nothing, uh, and and I wrote an article, a few articles about it. But you know, I am an education niche sort of uh, news site, so uh -huh. that if you don't know about me, you don't know about me. Right. Uh, so I'm hoping to you know, as we start talking about school funding in the legislative session, maybe there's another opportunity to explore what that study actually recommended. Okay. Wow. You know. Um, I still often say, you know, that parents, some things are in your hands too. True. You know, if you don't go out and tell your legislators, we need this, mm -hmm. we want this, mm -hmm. um, it, it, is, it is a need. We even talked about, you know, before the show, you know, um, and maybe we can talk about that too, you know bringing some of these people to the school and letting right. them see right. exactly, look, this is what we're dealing with, this right. is what we got. Right. You know, and sometimes it is, it, it's hard to, you can tell somebody something, mm -hmm. but it clicks when you bring them. Oh, absolutely, seeing it visually and seeing that, you know, anecdotally, I hear stories about libraries that don't have any library books. Um, you know, I, I, what? You know, but, but for almost 10 years, the state, there was no appropriation for library books. So you can understand uh, that some places would not have especially up-to-date library books. There in, uh, there's a county in Alabama that had to close two of its four schools. They had, to, they had four schools in the whole county. They're down to two now because they don't have the revenue to keep up the operations of the schools. How, this is 2016, how right. are we letting that happen? Exactly. And we just, and it just happens. And it happens in schools all over the country. So that's what I mean about these purposeful choices that we make. What we pay attention to, what we fund, where our priorities are, those are choices that we make. So, uh, and a lot of it is based on, you know, a lack of information. We don't have the information. Nobody knows where that county is and mm -hmm. nobody knows. And that's, um, that's a real struggle. I don't have the answer for that. I'm writing as fast as I can, right, I'm, you right, know, right. covering as many stories as I can. And this segment here right. allows such a great window into what's right. happening in public education. I appreciate your commitment right. to this and, you segment. Know, and I thank you, Trish, for bringing these things to us and bringing these things to the parents that we can bring to mm -hmm. the parents mm -hmm. and, and let them know that these issues are real. They're out there. Some right. things are being voted on. Some things may be falling through the cracks. Right. And and some things may not even be out there and maybe they don't even know. Right. You know, but like we said, sometimes it's up to us parents and, and different ones such as you mm -hmm. that are doing blogs and that are writing mm -hmm. and, you mm -hmm. know, telling that, you know, hey, 
this is out there. Right. And uh, I really appreciate you always coming to tell us these stories and kind of open it, open up our understanding on these things. Now we're not through, uh, Trish, we've got a whole lot more to cover. Right. So we want you to stay with us and we'll be right back. We're just gonna take a break here. Right. Hey, once again, thank you for being here with us. Trish, we're still here on the hot seat here. Yes. And uh, we're still talking about education, which is um, a big part of our, our children's lives mm -hmm. and an important part of our children's lives. Now, I want to ask you, you know, we had the No Child Left Behind, mm -hmm. and I think now that's been thrown out the window. It's been sort replaced. Of it's kind been of, replaced. Okay. Yeah, I won't say that. Been, been yeah. replaced yeah. with the... Every Student Succeed Act. Okay, tell Every us about student that. Every Student Succeeds Act, right. So you'll hear it referred to as ESSA, E-S-S-A. You know, educators love acronyms, okay. right? <laughs> Everything's an acronym. So uh, Every student, the Every Student Succeeds Act was um, passed by both houses of Congress in a very happy bipartisan way. Mm -hmm. I think they really wanted to get something accomplished before the end of the year. And President Obama signed it into law in December before Christmas. Um, there's still some development of the rules and regulations, right? Uh, but it did, it did a, a pretty big thing. And the biggest thing that it did, um, and the state, uh, states were applauding this, used to be we had adequate yearly progress. Remember AYP, you know, and there was a thing where you either um, passed AYP or you didn't. Mm -hmm. And you either, it was, you know, you pass or you fail. And we'd have the list of failing, you know, the schools who failed AYP and everybody would go, oh, it's terrible. We don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now the federal government, the U.S. Department of Education has totally turned over accountability to the states. Okay. So each state is now responsible for crafting its own accountability system. How are you going to make sure that every student succeeds? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those of us who appreciate a good dose of accountability are a little concerned mm -hmm. um, because this is how it was before No Child Left Behind. Every state was in charge of its own system. So why did we need No Child Left Behind if states were doing a good job of this? So civil rights advocates and disability advocates in particular are very concerned about this. And they're saying, how are we, without the federal government, um, you know, holding the, the, the stick over the school districts and the states, how are we going to make sure that kids who have been traditionally and historically marginalized in schools, how are we going to make sure that the kids get the education that they need, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to let the states decide. So that is going to be something parents really need to be at that table. When that work starts to mm -hmm. craft that new accountability system, parents need to listen up. Hopefully there'll be a lot of media interest. You know you'll find stuff at alabamaschoolconnection.org, right? Right, but, right. right. But, but hopefully the there will be lots of opportunities for parents to give some feedback. Um, it's, uh, it, we just don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. So the, at the state level, they are putting a team of people together to study mm -hmm. what did ESSA, what does ESSA require now? Mm -hmm. What can they let go of from the old No Child Left Behind years? And what do they need to do now? We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking probably for summer uh, before we really get a good idea of what it is that states need to be doing and how parents and teachers mm -hmm. are going to be at the table to determine that accountability system because that's really what this is all about, right? Student mm -hmm. outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, I think for too many years we we let the average carry the day mm -hmm. and in an average school you can have kids at the very low end of that spectrum who just get absorbed by the average and who's watching out for them besides their parents and you know at, it, so I liked the accountability that No Child Left Behind brought forward. I liked the idea of keeping track of subgroups. Mm -hmm. um, we will still have to disaggregate whatever data we collect on kids by subgroup. So we will still disaggregate based on race and ethnicity and disability status, English uh, speaking status, and poverty status. So we'll still know all that information, but it's like, okay, what are we going to do with it? So that's the biggest thing about um, ESSA, I think, that's going to impact 
uh, school districts. Okay. Now listen, I was told to ask you about the Marsh Bill. Oh, the Marsh Bill. <laughs> okay. Please explain to us about okay. the Marsh Bill. Back in December, um, it started in November, Senator Marsh, who is the Senate pro tem, which means he's the president of the Senate. That's kind of how I oversimplify in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, has been a very active education reformer. Okay, mm -hmm. He's introduced a lot of legislation. His name was on the Alabama Accountability Act. Um, he was very much for public charter schools. Okay, So he implemented, he, he floated a draft. Um, and I got a hold of it, and um, I published it, right, as a 49-page look at how um, Senator Marsh and those in the education reform world thought it might be a good idea to hold teachers accountable for what they do. And Senator Marsh has made a lot of comments um, that he wants to improve the teaching profession. He wants to reward good teachers and weed out the bad teachers. Most teachers will tell you that's what they want too. You know, <laughs> they, they, they don't get a kick out of having bad teachers around. It makes right. their jobs harder. Right. So right now uh, we have a system uh, that you automatically earn tenure after three years. Um, the bill that, that was being floated around, it was called the RAISE Act, and I'm sorry I don't remember uh, the exact, uh, another mm -hmm. acronym, R-A-I-S-E, but uh, it, it had four components to it. It had um, w one of the things that now Senator Marsh has said has been thrown out. It was going to attach um, bonuses, performance pay, to teachers who were rated highly effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. The word is that that's no longer in the bill. They're working on another draft. Okay. I have a, you know, so it, it's supposed to be filed very soon and we'll all be able to see what's in it. Another component was to change tenure to something that you have to earn, mm -hmm. um, from that it's not automatic after three years, that it is that you would earn it after five years. Mm -hmm. Tenure reform is something that most teachers agree with as well. They don't want it to be automatic. They do believe, at least the ones that I'm talking with, mm -hmm. have no problem with tenure reform. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but how do you earn that, right? And then how do you lose it? There was a provision for losing it too. It's based on your teacher effectiveness rating. And that teacher effectiveness rating uh, is, it was, I think they had five levels in the bill. And if you, five being the highest level of effectiveness and one being the lowest, and if you scored in the one or two range for two years in a row, you could lose tenure. Right. Um, so you want to keep, you know, teachers in the three, four, and five range of being effective. There are a lot of mechanics to that, mm -hmm. okay? So I think that yeah, I'm going to stay away from the details. But the other thing, um, so, so you had these teacher effectiveness ratings, and the teacher effectiveness ratings were going to be the key to earning tenure. They were going to be the key to performance pay. Um, they were not going to be key to where you land on a salary schedule, mm -hmm. okay? But they do want to do away with the way the current salary schedules are structured, which is often referred to as steps and ladders. And by that, it's like each year that you stay in a school system, you get more pay. Mm -hmm. In some school districts, it's only once every three years you get a bump in pay. The latter part, the L-A-D-D-E-R, um, is what I'm saying. The latter was if you get an advanced degree, you get to jump over to a higher pay scale. So if you get, if you earn a master's degree, you're no longer on the bachelor's degree. So there are a lot of folks that want to do away with the steps and ladder um, pay scale. So we don't know if that's in there anymore. There were, like I say, it was a 49-page bill, wow. and it had a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> in it. So I, what I've heard uh, is that they're going to simplify, that it's still probably going to be a number of pages, but that um, they've taken one of the components was this um, longitudinal data system. Mm -hmm. That was going. That was in a part of the RAISE Act. I understand that's been taken out, and a different um, legislator is going to introduce that as a separate bill. That the bill that Senator Marsh is now going to propose is really going to be based on tenure reform. Mm -hmm. So again, we have to wait until we see the final draft. But what was interesting about that, um, publishing a draft bill, I had not ever published a draft bill, but this one was such a big deal that I thought it's a, it's a matter of great public interest. I was. Um, encouraged by the response of people reading the bill 
and teachers and others who really wanted they let their voice be known. Mm -hmm. um, they talk to their legislators. We talk about that all the time. Right, like, right. And legislators tell me they really do want to hear from the folks right. back home. So there was a good dialogue that has happened in the last few weeks around this that I think has resulted in some changes being made. And that's what you hope, right? Is exactly. that you know, open up the democratic process, open up the discussion right. of these bills. Don't just file them in a committee and, and push them through really fast, like a few of the education reform bills have been pushed through really right. fast, and then figure out what's in it after you pass it. Let's talk about it. Wonderful. Okay, we're going to go for a break. Okay. Uh, we got one more segment here. We want you to stay with us, and uh, we'll be right back because uh, we want to talk a little bit about the online schools. No, we want to talk about the charter schools right. a little bit, so right. you stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> and thank you for being here. With, you should be behind the scenes sometimes here. <laughs> uh, but uh, Trish is here with us once again with the, for anybody that may be just tuning in, Alabama School Connection. And listen, we're giving you a wealth of information to think about, um, you know, to put in your minds and, and maybe talk to your different senators, legislators, or whatever to, to help our educational system be better. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to do that. And as long as Trish keeps coming to us and bringing, the, bringing us these stories where we can put them out there to you. And if you have questions to ask Trish, listen, she's the girl that can find you an answer. And so we thank you always once again. But Trish, we, um, we've got our last segment here. Okay. And um, I want to ask you, online classes, online, online classes. schools, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that's a big thing now. It is. You know, uh, there's been this uh, mechanism called ACCESS, and that's mm -hmm. another acronym that I can't tell you what the, the letters stand for. <laughs> okay. But we did a segment on ACCESS. Mm -hmm. We did a, 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 a Get Connected segment on ACCESS where kids can take online classes in their schools. Mm -hmm. All right, That was the idea that they would take them in their schools, maybe from a computer hub or something like that. That has evolved. Uh, last year, a law was passed that said that every school in Alabama, every school district is going to have to offer a totally online diploma by the 2016-17 school year. Okay, so that's coming up. You know, I mean, that's not far from now. So school districts have been busy trying to figure out how are we going to do that? How are we going to offer these ninth through 12th grade classes online. Mm -hmm. Some of them have used um, access. Some of them are going to use access. Some of them are contracting with other vendors from across the country uh, to give that content online. And I can't tell you what the legislator's intent was, but they were really intent on making this possible. And I, th I think it is seen as a way to deliver education to kids who might not do well in a traditional public school environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful, though. Um, the jury's still out on whether or not online schools are a great thing. Some kids do well, some kids don't. Mm -hmm. And it's a really personal choice. You have to understand you have to have a self-motivated um, student to be able to do online school. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing the school districts roll that out. Uh, and I would say to anybody who's considering online school for your child, make sure you, you know, do a little bit of research. You can find some stuff on my site, but you can just Google virtual school or online high school and you'll get a mix of articles about who it works well for and who it doesn't. Okay. Now let's talk about Charter. Okay. Charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, public charter schools. They're public schools, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the bill was passed last year. Um, we actually recently got uh, a lot of kudos for having a very strong charter law. We were ranked number two in the nation for the strength of our charter law, which uh, you know, it's always in who's doing the ranking, but it was based on what safeguards do you have in place and how are you going to make sure that you can keep track of how well the kids are doing and what kind of control do you have over the charter um, school operators. Right now, we're still 
in the midst of planning, mm -hmm. okay? The, there were four districts that became charter authorizers. Birmingham City was one. Mm -hmm. Once you decide to be your own charter authorizer, then you have to come up with an application for charter schools. You have to come up with an application review process. You have to put out requests for proposals. Sometimes you see that RFP, mm -hmm. another acronym, to where you a school district would say very specifically, we need a charter school operator to submit a request for uh, 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 that can help us with this area mm -hmm. that we need help with. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's kids in poverty. Maybe it's kids with special needs. Maybe it's um, maybe the district wants to start some um, civics-based program. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a, a charter school totally revolving around civics. So there's a lot of opportunity for innovation. The cap um, is ten charter schools. Okay, for in a, in a one year uh, time frame. Mm -hmm. So there are no charter applications that are ready for prime time yet. Um, it will be the 2017 18 school year, mm -hmm. is what we've been told before the first charter schools will be operating, mm -hmm. which gives us a whole year uh, of planning. And what, what um, the recommended procedure is going to be that you apply to be a charter school. And there are a lot of regulations there. I'm not going into detail here. You can, not just anybody can be a charter school. You really have to, you know, some of these applications are going to be really, really thick. Um, you have to know exactly what you want to do and have measures and, you know. But you, once you submit that application, the ideal thing is to have a year of planning after your application is approved. So therefore, Very so. slow. For us to be looking for one to pop up tomorrow, that's not going to happen. It can't happen. It can't happen the way the law is written. Mm -hmm. uh, and look for, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that more boards of education will become charter authorizers. The, the opportunity is open right now. Mm -hmm. I think they have until sometime in March um, mm -hmm. to become a charter authorizer. So they will decide if they don't become their own charter authorizer, then the state commission can authorize those charter schools for them. They're meeting on a regular basis, but they are making slow progress, right? And they have not approved an application yet. So it's just plugging along, but nothing, we're not going to see any charter schools pop up. No. Okay. <laughs> All right, because I think that's what a lot of people are thinking that, sure. okay, here comes the charter schools, bam, there it goes. But right. It's not that easy. Can't happen. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we got about four minutes here. Okay. Upcoming things passed, but not implicated yet. Okay. All right. One of the really important things that just happened that there's a lot of confusion about, I've seen a lot of media stories, the State Board of Education passed a resolution to allow adjunct teachers mm -hmm. into the classroom, mm -hmm. okay? That means they're not certified, all right? It was a resolution um, which gives the State Board of Education a lot of flexibility. If this doesn't go well, they can rescind their resolution. But they, they, uh, they made this resolution. It very specifically allows for people with business uh, or industry um, experience. Think retired engineering professor or think um, someone with some expertise in broadcast or something, typically career tech areas, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. The idea behind it was to augment or add to the way that teachers can get into the classroom. And that adjunct teacher has to be, it can only be part-time, and can, uh, has to be under the supervision of a certified teacher. So we're not just opening the doors and letting anybody come in and teach our kids. Also, really important, Cannot be done in elementary school, mm -hmm. cannot be done in early childhood education, um, and cannot be done in special education. So mm -hmm. all those areas you still have to have certified teachers. It's going to be up to the local districts to implement this properly. Um, if there's any abuse or any concern about people getting into the classroom that don't need to be in front of teachers, mm -hmm. the state board has the authority to pull that back. Okay. Now, that's the one thing you said. Now, they're not... <laughs> you use the word not certified, mm -hmm. uh, but it could mean they have been a teacher and maybe haven't kept up with their certification, sure. but their expertise in certain areas or whatever. Right. So right. It, it's not a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing. It, and it's supposed to be used sparingly, uh -huh. not, in, not in a broad sense of, 
uh, oh good, I don't have to have certified teachers anymore. Plus, they're only allowed to work part time, right? And they don't get benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't, I, you know, again, it was for a very specific way to get a welding instructor, mm -hmm. or you know, you've got retired professors. What if if they had to go through the certification process, they'd have to go back and take four courses at the university, and they'd have to pass content level tests, and they're just a lot of people that aren't willing to go to that trouble, but they could really add to a student experience in the classroom. Okay, it's going to be watched carefully, though. Okay, now I don't know if you can sum this one up in one minute here, mm, but try. the Alabama Administrative Code? Sure, the Alabama Administrative Code is just a book of regulations, okay? All the state agencies, anybody who is a state agency has to develop their rules in, and, and they're printed in the Alabama Administrative Code. If you Google it right now, you can pull it up. You can pull up the one for the State Board of Education and you'll see all their rules. It's kind of like a procedure manual, mm -hmm. right? So you have the state constitution as a framework, right? That, and then you've got the laws that are passed in the legislature. That Those go into the Code of Alabama. And then you've got the Alabama Administrative Code, which develops further what those laws are about, okay? Because laws are supposed to be general, and then the Alabama Administrative Code gets into the nitty-gritty of this is how you do it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. But it's public access. Absolutely. So you can definitely go in there and look look at all the different Absolutely. codes. Absolutely. Yep. Great. Trish, once again, you always bring us something great. Thank you. And thank you, and thank you for being here with us on The Alabama Way.